Hello, gentlemen, and welcome again. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the second half of the impact of nationalism on Europe. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, Eastern Europe, especially how uh, that it differed from uh, what we looked at with Western Europe, with Germany and Italy as a unifying factor uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, nationalism actually created a separating factor. So we're going to be looking at that and the little picture that I, I placed on the bottom, uh, nationalism, uh, and the quote from Albert Einstein, this is kind of one of those things where we're going to look at uh, how nationalism was a negative uh, factor within uh, that area. So two questions to think about as we go through this. Uh, how did nationalism threaten the long-standing empires of Eastern Europe, and how did these empires handle the rise of nationalism? Did it help or hurt their rule? First one we're going to look at is Austria. Now, Austria is uh, one of those Eastern European empires. Uh, it is ruled by the Habsburgs. Uh, Francis I uh, at, is the emperor at this time. Uh, his second uh, in command is Clements von Metterich. Uh, both of these gentlemen are uh, very conservative in their viewpoints on how rulers should rule. Uh, again, appointed by God, should have last say in everything, absolute control. Uh, but Francis is of the Habsburg family, and the Habsburgs were some of the most important uh, it was one of the most important families in European history. Uh, because they controlled not only the Holy Roman Empire, um, but their lineage can be drawn back to Charles V, uh, who not only controlled the Holy Roman Empire consisting of Germany and Austria, uh, but also uh, controlling of Spain and on up into the uh, Netherlands. Now, the Spanish Habsburg family dies out. Uh, the last ruler of the Spanish Habsburgs are it was Charles II, and it's tragic because uh, they fail in Spain because of inbreeding, which is highlighted on this uh, little chart right there. Uh, Charles II is the last in line um, because of inbreeding, and you should know this from uh, covering biology, uh, the dominant traits and recessive traits that are shared by the parents. Uh, because of inbreeding, uh, the dominant traits uh, become too dominant, and one of the dominant traits in the Habsburgs was known as the Habsburg chin, or the Habsburg jaw, uh, which was very prominent, strong jaw, uh, but because of the inbreeding, uh, Charles II supposedly uh, could not close his mouth because his jaw was too big, uh, so he drooled. He also had an uh, IQ of a third grader uh, by the time he was 30. So it was just a tragic, tragic ending to, the, to this family in Spain. So because of that, uh, the Austrian Habsburgs try and maintain power as much as possible. Uh, but they're having issues during this time. Uh, number one, Austria and the Austrian Empire is made up of several different cultures and ethnicities. Uh, so that's an issue. You also have the absolute monarchy uh, who is claiming complete control, uh, placing many restrictions on the people. Even the, th the mention of the word constitution could get you thrown in jail. Uh, they're also very slow to modernize, and that's because, as we've seen with uh, other countries who modernized, moved into the Industrial Revolution, uh, with that modernization, you also have the call for workers' rights, women's rights, and the people want a, a larger voice within society. So. Uh, they are very slow to modernize. And Francis, uh, when giving advice to his son, uh, Francis Joseph, who we'll be looking at uh, in just a moment, he tells him to rule and change nothing. And also talking about uh, the people of his empire, he says, people I only know of subjects. So this kind of gives you an idea of uh, his mentality and, and the way that he views uh how to rule. But during this time, you also have nationalists who are constantly demanding for equal say and land. But because there are so many different groups, 
uh, this is a threat to the empire uh, because it'll just get ripped apart if he tries to give land to each individual culture and people. Uh, and then also uh, government will say, you know, it'll just tear them apart. So it's a very, very volatile time period in Austrian history. But Francis is out. And Francis Joseph is now the emperor. Uh, he comes in at a very young age. You can check out the sweet mutton chops. Um, he is given the keys to the empire, but it's very similar to you being given the keys uh, to a nice 1972 Pinto, uh, which has the threat of exploding at any time it gets dinged on the bumper. Uh, that's really what Austria was like. It was a very volatile area. It could be bl it could blow up at any time. Uh, but Francis Joseph is now in charge and tr needs to find a way of maintaining order and keeping this thing from exploding. So the first thing he does is he writes up a constitution, establishes a, a, a legislature. Uh, but the problem is that this new government is dominated by German-speaking Austrians, which is a minority group in Austria. So the majority of the population still doesn't have a say in government. He then appoints Francis Deke, and Deke comes up with a great idea under the Compromise of 1867, where he would create a dual monarchy. Uh, now, when we first think of dual monarchy, we think of two kings ruling. What happens is Francis Joseph, because he doesn't want to lose any power, uh, he then becomes king of two countries. And his empire is split into Austria and Hungary. He becomes the emperor of Austria and the king of Hungary. And easy way to think about it, since we've covered it before, think of the Articles of Confederation. Uh, they share the big things with finances, defense, and foreign affairs, but they each have their own separate governments, constitutions. Okay, They take care of their own business. Uh, they do share... Francis Joseph as their single leader. This was a way of trying to maintain power and keep control. Uh, but again, it's only a small portion of the population. The Slavic groups that make up a, a, a large chunk of the Austrian-Hungarian population still have no say in government. Uh, so they become the more outspoken group and extremists when it comes to uh, calling for change. And this map just shows you how it was broken down uh, with Austria surrounding uh, Hungary. So uh, the area down below, the Bosnia-Herzegovina, okay, this is one of those areas that is a hotbed for tension. Uh, and they especially take part uh, or following the wars uh, in the Balkans in 1912. Just sharing a little quote from our old friend Otto von Bismarck. Uh, as stated before, Otto von Bismarck was one of those guys who could see you know, five steps ahead of everyone else. So he really called the shot uh, with this one. Uh, if there is ever another war in Europe, it will come out of some damned silly thing in the Balkans. So he called the shot because he saw that the Balkan Peninsula was very volatile, uh, even during his time. And all that tension really comes out of the failing of the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottomans have had control over this area uh, for close to 400 years. Um, they have been able to maintain order because they were very tolerant. They didn't care what people did, how, what they practiced, what language they spoke, as long as they were uh, more, uh, as long as they kept order and they didn't uh, rock the boat. But starting in the 1800s, uh, the Ottoman Empire is on a, a very quick decline. Um, it was known as the sick man of Europe, uh, and this Balkan area uh, is working to try and gain its independence. So in 1912, you have the first Balkan War, and this was a war for independence. Uh, these little Balkan states, uh, with the help of the European powers like Britain, Germany, Austria-Hungary, uh, gained their independence from the Ottomans. 
So you now have the creation of Serbia, Greece, Bulgaria, and Albania. Uh, but quickly following that, uh, you have the Second Balkan War, uh, which is a war for expansion. Each Balkan state attacking one another, trying to expand. Serbia actually becomes the, the biggest aggressor. Um, and they're looking to take land from Austria and Germany, uh, who gained a little bit of land following uh, the First Balkan War. Uh, Austria claims Sarajevo and Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, around it, which the Serbs uh, claim to be theirs, and they want to see liberated. Uh, so they're calling for that. If you know anything about history, uh, so 1912, the War for Independence, 1913, the War for Expansions, and then 1914, World War I. Uh, so again, Bismarck called the shot, and you now have a major war coming out of uh, this area, all because of this tensions. And again, the Ottomans were able to maintain control over this area. Uh, there were problems, but it wasn't as volatile as it was after these guys gained their independence. And then, last, you have Russia. Uh, now, Russia, I placed a little thing on iTunes U, a uh, video that you can watch to get a little bit more in-depth history. But basically, Russia had the same problems. Uh, they were slow to modernize. They were unwilling to, to give up power. The absolute monarchs, uh, the czars were. Um, but they had an even bigger problem because it flip-flopped between czars. One czar would be more liberal, while the other, the next one would be more conservative. And it really pulled on the people to, to know where they were at uh, within Russia and, and gaining independence or gaining some rights and then rights being restricted. Uh, so Russia was very volatile. And then finally, when World War I breaks out and Tsar Nicholas II is in charge, he is a weak leader and uh, the communists are able to take uh, full advantage of this and they then lead the overthrow of the Tsar. Uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. This is a little flow chart just to show you, uh, kind of uh, recap what we just talked about. We have the Italian and German unification to the right, the uh, Eastern European troubles to the left, uh, all culminating in the outbreak of World War I. So just to recap, okay, how did nationalism threaten the long-standing empires of Eastern Europe, and how did these empires handle the rise of nationalism? Uh, Make sure to be able to answer these questions. Also use this to fill in that chart that's attached to iTunes U. And I'll see you later.